it around this morning, Lord. Turn it around, Lord. Turn it around. Father, we thank you. 
thank you that you are God that speaks to us. You are the Lord that sends your word, O God. And the word that you send, Lord, is like rain that comes upon the earth and waters the earth, O Lord, and causes the earth to produce. Father, we thank you for the word that you have spoken to us, Lord. Father, we thank you for the word that you have released in our hearts, O Lord, the seed that we have received, O God, precious Lord. Your word, O God, is alive. It is powerful, Lord. It is sharper than any double-edged sword, Father. Yes, it is able to pierce, O God, to enter every area of our lives and bring life, O God. And we thank you, Father, for the life of your word. We thank you, O God, for the things that you planted in our hearts, O God, in the course of this month. The way that has come to us, we want to thank you, Father. We want to embrace our God and welcome this word of God. We want to say, Lord, it shall be true unto us according to your word. For your word forever is settled in heaven, O precious Lord. Father, let your word be true, O God, to us. Give us, O God, the desire for this word, O God. Give us, O God, the desire for your word. Plan a new desire, Father. A new hunger for your word, O precious Lord. Help us to attend to your word. Give us the grace, O oh Lord, to attend to your word. Give us the grace, O oh precious Lord, to keep our eyes before your word, O oh God. Father Jehovah, to listen, O oh God, to hear the word of God. Father, to be doers, O oh God, to meditate on that word. In the name of Jesus, we want to prepare, Lord, our hearts. We want to offer our hearts, O oh God, that our hearts may be ready, O oh God, that the seed of your word, O oh God, will be planted, that you will take root God. And we 
can obtain you victory through your word. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for the change of God. Yes, that is coming, oh precious Father. We give you the praise, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Lastly, we just want to pray and thank God that is changing our story. Praise the Lord. It says in John chapter 1, verse 14, um, one of the two which had John speak and followed him was Andrew. Andrew was the brother of Simon, who was a disciple, initially a disciple of John the Baptist. But when he was introduced to Jesus, he followed Jesus. Amen. And he also introduced his father, Simon. That, that was his first encounter with the Lord. And when he encountered the Lord, Jesus said to Simon, You are Simon, the son of Jonah, but you shall be called the Cephas, which is interpretation is told. Praise the Lord. He says you shall be changed, your story shall be changed. You're a fish of men. You're a fish of fish, but you're going to be a fish of men. Praise the Lord. He changed you from being a fisherman to a fish of men. And we want to thank God that the Lord is changing the story of our lives. Amen. We want to thank God that he's bringing transformation in every area of our lives. Praise the Lord. That God will change our story, our destiny, the course of our destiny is being rewritten. That things will not be the same. Amen. We thank you, precious God. We give you praise, O oh God. Father, we thank you that you are changing our story, O oh God. Father, we thank you, O oh God, that Lord, you are redefining, O oh God, the course of our destiny. You are bringing us into alignment with your will and your purposes for us. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for the new things that you are bringing forth. Father, we thank you, Lord, you said, Behold, and feel a new thing, Lord, you are bringing forth. Father, we welcome it, we receive it, your precious Lord. We open our hearts to what you are doing, O oh God, and we commit, Lord, that you will walk in obedience, O oh Father. Yes, in the name of Jesus, Lord, as we look to you, Father, as we set our eyes on you, Lord, we thank you, precious Lord, that you are changing us. As we look into your word, you are changing us from glory to glory, Father. You are changing and lifting us up, O God. You are healing us through your word, O God, that brings healing. Father, we thank and bless you, Lord. Even today, Lord, we pray so. We thank you for your word. And the entrance of your word brings light, O God. We thank you for light and understanding that you are bringing forth, O God. In the name of Jesus, that you are enlightened us, O oh God, to see the things that you are doing, O oh God, the things that you have called us to, O oh God. Father, we yield to you, Lord, as, our, as, as individuals, O oh Lord. Yes, as, in our church, as the church of Christ, we yield to you, Lord. And we thank you, Father. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Pastor Rogers. Setting the foundation for us. Greetings to you this morning. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, Chief. May she take the place. Praise God. Amen. Team takes the place. Amen. Praise God. Greetings to you in the wonderful name of Jesus and welcome. We praise God for the wonderful foundation that has been set this morning. It's been a build up over this last couple of days, weeks, and uh, now a culmination into Covenant Sunday this morning. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. So let's hear what God has to say to us and, and just flow along with what God is sharing with us. We have communion ready for you. We've got testimonies as well. So bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Now we started not so long ago with a series uh, entitled Dealing with Death. And um, this week uh, there was so much to share. We just couldn't complete it last week uh, in its entirety. So um, this morning, uh, I'll just uh, title this section, Living a Debt-Free Life. Living a Debt-Free Life. And I just want to quickly issue a disclaimer before we get into the nitty-gritty of the message. Just to say, like I said last week, that there are certain organizations, there are certain people that uh, work for and belong to the financial institutes around the world, like banks, financial houses, uh, there are companies that work with finances and they maintain that you must have a certain amount of manageable debt with regards to running your company and stuff like that. And I'm not here to get into your head. I'm not a financier, as I said. I'm simply a preacher of the Word of God. So for where this Word is applicable and if it's applicable to you, you take it home with you. Amen. So this morning, living a debt-free life. Ask yourself the question, is it God's will for me to live debt-free? 
And like we said in Romans 12, the Bible speaks about the good, the acceptable, and then the perfect will of God. And we want to aim to be in the perfect will of God with regards to our lives, with regards to our dealings, with regards to our health, with regards to our position in life, our responsibilities in life, ministry, career, and even in the area of finances. And please don't limit your understanding of finances to just money. You've got to understand why we are laboring the point on things like finances is because the Lord has called us to walk in dominion and power. And if there's one area in which you exercise dominion and power, it's in the area of finances. Amen. Just like it is in health. Just like it is in demonology. This is an area in which you exercise dominion and authority. And God has called us to walk in dominion and authority. So it's not about the money. It's about the dominion and the authority. The money comes as a result of your victorious walking with God. Amen. So living a debt-free life. Number one, make a quality decision that I'm going to live a debt-free life. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 says, <coughs> See, I have set today life and goodness as well as death and disaster. God says, see, I've set life and death before you. In other words, God encourages us to make a choice. With, with, with certain things are concerned in our lives. Make a choice. And in verse 19 he says, Now I call heaven and earth to witness the choice you made. Other translations, God says, I call heaven and earth to record the decision you made. I want you to see that heaven makes a note of your decisions and your choices in life. It's recorded, literally written down. So whatever your decision is, God is going to write it down. And I want to encourage you to make the right decision going forward. Like any spiritual victory, becoming debt free begins with a decision. Being born again, receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior begins with a decision. Living a righteous and holy life before God begins with a decision. So too with living a debt free life, it begins with a decision. Amen. And you are only one decision away from your dead freedom. Listen to this statement, and this is so powerful. The moment you make a quality decision to be dead free, God sees you as dead free. Whatever decision we make in the Lord, for the Lord, God sees you as it. When you say today, Lord, I choose to be saved, give my life to Jesus Christ, God doesn't take you on a path of progression to see if you are saved. He sees you as saved. He sees you as redeemed. He sees you instantly the moment you make your decision. And if you make that decision today, God sees you as dead free. And watch your life turn it around. Turn around for good like we sang this morning. He will turn it around for good. Amen. The hardest part of any journey is taking the first step. And uh, we want to pray this morning, this first point, we want to pray it instead of preach it, that many will take the first step. Many will find the courage to take the first step and step towards living a dead free life in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. And so I want to encourage you to say to be bold and to be strong. God is with you. And God is always saying, jump and I'll catch you. He's saying, jump and I'll catch you. So taking the first step of this journey of faith, get God's guidance. I'm not just giving you steps towards freedom, three steps towards prosperity, five steps to get out of debt. It's about following God and following God's guidance. I want you to be employed. I want you to call upon the Lord. I want you to bring God into your situation. I'm not, I'm not a strategist just giving formulas that work for that matter. But I'm a person that's saying to you, bring God into your situation. It's not about formulas. It's about bringing God into the situation. Amen. And I love what Peter said in, in Matthew 14, 29. He says, Lord, if that's you, he couldn't recognize Jesus walking on the water, doing the improbable, doing the impossible. He didn't recognize Jesus in the midst of the storm. He couldn't recognize his Lord and Savior. But when he realized it's Jesus, he said, Lord, if it's you, call me, bid me. In other words, command me to come. That's what the word bids means. It means command me. And when God commands you, he empowers you to do what he commands you to do. Because when the word of God comes, the word of God has the power in itself to accomplish what God says it must accomplish. So he says, if that's you, command me to come. And by the power of your command, I'll walk on the water too. And Peter took his first step on the water. 
Can I encourage you to take your first step of walking on the waters of impossibility and improbability and do the miraculous? Because after all, we serve a supernatural God and we are called to walk in the supernatural in the name of Jesus. Faith advances. Faith never retreats. Can I say to you, if it's in the Word of God, faith will get it for you. If it's in the Word of God, faith will get it for you. If you can see it in the Word, then you can take it to God in prayer. If you can see it in the Word, then you can wave it over the devil and over your situation and say to the devil, this is what the Word of God says. Hallelujah. Because the Word of God is strong enough for any situation. The Word of God is strong enough against the devil's word, against the devil's attack. And whatever you can see in the Word, you can show it to the devil who's beneath your feet and say, devil, beneath my feet, that's where you stay. This is what the Word of God says. Amen. Hallelujah. So if it's in the Word, and if you can see it, you can use it. But I want to ask you a question as we get deeper into the world this morning. Just how far will you go on the Word? How far can the Word challenge your faith to step out into the realms of the impossible? Can I just say this morning, can I just say unequivocally, that the Word of God is strong enough for any situation? Let me say that again. The Word of God is strong enough for any situation. The only limitation comes from our side. In the name of Jesus, bear with me and allow me to run through the things that God has laid on my heart and you will be blessed by the Word this morning. Amen. And if you make up your mind, make a quality decision, not a half-hearted decision. The reason why many people come to church, give their lives to Jesus and backslide is because they have not made a quality decision. But the reason why you are here, I'm glad to say this morning, is because 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 20 years ago, you made a quality decision to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And regardless of the stress, regardless of the problems and challenges you've gone through, COVID-19 and all and everything else, you are here today because of that quality decision. And if you make a quality decision to say, I'm going to live the debt-free life, I'm going to live the life and the quality that's just a little higher, God's got a higher echelon for me to live by and live in, and I want to ascend to that higher level. Come on now, I've been living too long in the valley, I've been living too long in the low and lows of life, but too long in this place. The palace calls for me. The palace calls for me. Hallelujah. How far will you go? Make up your mind and make a quality decision and say, I'm not willing to live debt free. I'm not willing to live in lack. I want to live in divine prosperity in Jesus' name. And I just want to read a portion of scripture. Sometimes I'm, 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 I'm amazed at how God works. I, I, I try to be logical and sometimes God just puts something that's illogical in my notes. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. But he gives you the wisdom to figure it out. Let, let me read it to you. Exodus 12 verse 36. Exodus 12 verse 36. And the Lord gave the people such favor in the sight of the Egyptians that they granted their request. In this way they plundered the Egyptians. The Lord gave the Israelites such favor that whatever they asked, they got. Now that's a preaching point on its own, but I don't want to deviate from what I'm saying. I want to keep on track. And as I said, I don't know why sometimes God puts these things in there, in my nose, but He does. But this is what followed after I obeyed the Lord. And this is what the Lord said to me. He says, after they granted the Israelites their request, the creditors came after the Israelites and said, we want our slaves back. We want our money that we loaned you back. And then God drowned them. <laughs> and then the point that I believe that God would have me deliver to you is this. I don't know how God's going to get you out of debt. But I know He is. And He's got a plan that will supersede your plan. That will boggle your pretty little mind. And leave you rejoicing. With the way God works. His ways are not your ways and His thoughts are not your thoughts. You just got to do the job of believing and leave the battle to the Lord. You are only one decision away from living a life of debt freedom. Can you make that decision today? Lord, I pray that you be with your people.
people as they make vital steps and vital choices this morning. And not just deliberate the word, but make decisions on the word. Amen. Number two, point number two. In terms of getting out of debt and living a debt-free life, you've got to formally present your agreement to the Heavenly Father. Formally present your agreement to the Heavenly Father. Let me read to you from Isaiah 41 and verse 21. Isaiah 41, 21, and the Bible says, Present your case, says the Lord. Bring your strong reasons, says the God of Jacob. In other words, you need to write out your, your request. You don't simply bring it as a prayer point um, in terms of give us this day our daily bread. We need to learn to differentiate between prayers that conform to give us this day our daily bread and high court prayers. This is a prayer that you've got to take to the high courts. And we as lawyers in training for reigning, need to understand how to map, write up, and present these requests to God in prayer. You don't just flip your gums and just say them off, off the bat and off the tip of your tongue. You lay it up, you write out your agreement. When Hezekiah got a letter that distressed him, the Bible says Hezekiah spread out the letter before the Lord and said, Lord, look at what this man is doing, how he's challenging me. We must spread out this letter of agreement that we are writing. And it's called a letter of agreement because you must do it in agreement with your husband. Do it in agreement with your wife or with your pastor. And then more importantly, do it in agreement with God. Because Amos 3 and 3 says, two cannot walk together unless they be agreed. You must be agreed with God. It's God's will for you to come out of that pit of despair, that pit of financial disaster. It's God's will for you to come out. So you got to write the letter of agreement and say, Lord, I'm in agreement with you. I'm in agreement with your word. And I map it out for you. And like I said, these are high court prayers. Anyway, you write your name down on a legal document on earth where you sign, it is recorded in heaven. Whatever transpires on earth is recorded in heaven. So in the same way you need to write out this thing, you need to bring those bank papers and present them before the Lord and say, Lord, you represent me in the high courts of heaven. Here is this agreement that I have with this financial institute. Represent me in the high courts of heaven. Speak to the Father on my behalf and bring a strong case as to why I should be exonerated. Because that's what God says. He says, present your case. Now he's talking legal terms when he says, present your case. You don't just come with words, you've got to write it out. Like I shared over the weeks gone by. You write it out and then you bring it to the Lord. And the Lord says, bring forth your strong reasons. In other words, you've got to come with a motivation. In a lot of companies, where you request something, your boss or your manager will say, write a letter of motivation. Or if you want a, 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 an NPO, as an NPO, if you're approaching a bank, a company, whatever the situation, and you want something from them, they say, write a letter of motivation. You need to bring a strong letter prayer of motivation. Why should God let you free? It's not the bank's choice to let you go. It's God's choice to let you go. Whatever God frees, man's got to obey and abide by. If God says you're free, you are free. Hallelujah. I don't know how, but I know he will do it. It's his decision in the name of Jesus and at the end of the day. And so you've got to bring your strong motivation. And this is why we're teaching financial principles so that you can say, Lord, in light of your word, I bring this to you. Now in Nehemiah, Nehemiah, the people were so deep in debt. It says there were also those who said, we are mortgaging our field, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain. In other words, the loan that they had on their property and their fields, they took another loan just to get grain, to put it in the ground, to get a harvest so they could get income to pay the bills that was mounting up. So they had bills upon bills in Nehemiah's time. Nehemiah chapter 5, verses 3 to 5. I, beg, I apologize, we don't have the overheads. So I'm going to give you the scriptures and you can follow them up. So these people had borrowed against borrowing. And they said, we have to borrow because we are in trouble. So you need to bring your motivation to the Lord and say, we are borrowing or we have taken a loan because of X, Y, and Z. 
And God's a reasonable God. The story of the prodigal son is a story of God's mercy where financial redemption is concerned. Mm. It's not a story of God dishing out retribution to someone who haphazardly handled his finances. It's a story of mercy and grace. And it's the story that sums us up as well this morning. Amen. Hallelujah. Now as you are going forward in presenting your case, you write out your debt. You present it before the Lord. And then you must have scriptures. You need to have at least three scriptures upon which you stand. Why three? Because the Bible says, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, a matter is confirmed. And the Bible says that God always confirms His Word from the Old to the New Testament. He always confirms His Word. Praise the Lord. So if you're standing on two or three scriptures, it is a confirmed matter and you know you can take it to God and God is not going to reject this thing because in light of His Word, He has to accept it. You remember it's His Word and you bring His Word to Him. And in the book of Psalms it says, He has elevated His Word above His name. Such is the case because God is a God of integrity and His Word has to do with His character and His nature. And so God will not allow His Word to bring Him into ill repute. So He will abide and follow His Word, stand behind His Word to perform it. So you bring two or three scriptures. Number one is to show God you know what you're talking about. You cannot make a request until you know it's in the Word. If you can find it in the Word, your faith can start to work for you. Faith coming by hearing and hearing the word of God. And it's not just reading the sweet psalms about the sweet by and by, the Lord is my shepherd. Faith doesn't come from that. Faith comes from knowing the promises. Faith comes from knowing the promises that are made to you. Faith comes from knowing the promises that are applicable to you. And when you can see it as yours, that's when faith rises. And that's when faith goes to God in prayer and says, Lord, I can see it as mine and I want it. And more importantly, you realize God wants to give it to you. He's not fighting you. This is not tug of war. You know, there's a little teeny me and God pulls it and you pulling it and he's pulling it. No, it's something he wants to give. He wants to release. But your desire forms the ability and creates the environment to receive it without losing it and abusing it. Hallelujah. Amen. Can you see that? So two or three scriptures. And uh, I'll just give you a few. Deuteronomy 15 verse 6. Again, I apologize for not having the overheads. So I'm not going to read it. I'll give it to you because you are going to see it for yourself. Deuteronomy 15 verse 6. Proverbs 22 verse 7. Romans 13 verse 8. And then I want to just read to you from Deuteronomy 28 verse 12. And it says, The Lord will open to you His good treasure, the heavens, to give the rains to your land in a season and to bless all the works of your hands. You shall lend to many nations and you shall not borrow. You shall lend to many nations and you shall not borrow. Hallelujah. And then finally, once you've drafted out this whole plan on a nice spreadsheet, you can do it on a computer, do it on a written piece of paper, keep it handy. I keep it on a piece of paper because whenever I travel, I know I can take this with and I can work on it and I lay hands on it. And this is what you do. You lay hands on it and you say, according to Romans 13 verse 8, the word of God says that I should owe no man anything but that I should love every man. Now Lord, I owe these people. And you list your credits and you say, thank you Lord that I'm free from this obligation. Thank you Lord, you give me the power to break free, to come out of this obligation in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Can I give you a quick testimony before I hop over to my third point? Very important. Many years ago, I got entangled in this holiday timesheet thing. Please, I implore you, don't, if you're laughing, don't go anywhere near those things. It's a, they don't tell you this, it's a lifelong commitment. You just pay and pay and pay and you never go on holiday. When you phone them, they say, no, all the holidays are gone. I, I can see I've got some friends here. I'm not alone in my, in my uh, distress here. And then after a while we said, no, let's get rid of this. And then you realize you signed a contract that you can't get out of. And we prayed about it. My wife and I prayed about it. And during COVID, these people came to us and they made us an offer we can't refuse. They said, pay us so much and we'll release you. I came back to them with a counter offer, which was half of what they proposed. And they accepted. I paid and I'm now free of that thing. Amen. Amen. The point is, God can set you free. Don't say it's impossible. Don't say it's impossible. God knows how to get you out of any obligation, any commitment. He can pull you out. 
God in the name of Jesus. Psalm 34, 17. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and he delivers. Someone say delivers. He delivers me out of all my trouble. He delivers me out of pain. He delivers me out of sickness. He delivers me out of my financial woes. Come on this morning. Let faith arise. Amen. So number one, make that quality decision. Number two, you're going to write it out and present it to the Lord. Like it looks like a legal document. It must be like a legal document. My advocate Jesus. And I'm the, I'm the innocent in this whole thing. You map it out like a, a legal document and take it to God. Amen. Now watch this now. Before I flip over to my third point. God says put me in remembrance. He says let us plead, uh, plead together. Declare thou that you may be justified. Isaiah 43, 26. I've just read it to you. He says, let us plead together. In other words, God invites you to reason with him. In Isaiah, he said, bring your strong reasons. Now he says, let us plead together. In other words, God wants to listen to your argument. Why must I let you free? Do you know the scriptures? Do you know the error of your way? Can you take cognizance for your actions that got you into this situation in the first place? This is what God's looking for, and I'll touch on that as we go through. But like I said, God's a merciful God. He's not looking for you to say, yes, I'm guilty, Lord. And they say, yeah, stay in that situation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it serves you right. Stay there. No, God doesn't need circumstances to teach you. It's only if you're going to be rebellious and stubborn. God can teach you anyway. Amen. So he says, let us plead together. In other words, let's reason together. And then God says, listen to this. Then declare thou, you must say, I am free, that you may be justified. To be justified means you are no longer guilty, no longer liable. That's what he says. And so this is powerful, but take time to work through it in your own time. Your confession must become a declaration. Now, if you are lacking faith in your declarations, and remember, we shared over the last couple of weeks the things to say. I'm no longer under death. I hand my death over to God, all of that. And so what I want to share with you is this. A person came to me last week immediately after the service and said, you know, and I'm happy this person did, I'm happy. The person came and said, you know, we've been hearing about this prosperity thing for years. We're still in trouble. We're still paying for our cars. We're still paying for our houses. I, I like that. I like that. Because now I'm coming right back to you with the word of God. Not an apology for something that didn't work out in your life. Because I know as a preacher of the gospel that the word of God is yea and amen. It says, let all men be liars, but let God be true. His word is yea and amen. If it's not working, there's something on our side. We need to do some tweaking now here this morning. Amen. So I'm coming right back to you with a rebuttal that comes right out of the word of God. Amen. amen. If you're lacking faith in your confession, maybe after you've done your whole thing, and you've done your confession, yes, I'm about not beneath, mm -hmm. I'm the head, not the tail. But Monday rolls by and everything changes. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you are the tail, not the head. <laughs> it looks like you are underneath, not above. And you're singing a different song on Monday, Willie Bob. You know, it's a different tune yes. to the one you were singing on Sunday. You know, turn up, what do I do, Lord? Your faith is lacking in your confession. Yes. If you doubt your confession, the thing you prayed about is not strong enough. And that's what I want to get into this morning. What? What's this? You need to re-examine the whole pointers that I've been sharing with you over the last couple of weeks. Go back to point number one. Re-examine the verses that I gave you about debt excellence, about getting out of debt. Re-examine the scriptures. Do you understand them? Are they making sense to you? Faith coming by hearing and hearing the word. Are you getting the right scriptures? What you need to do with the scriptures you already have is reword them. Mm -hmm. I think you've noticed how I reword yes. practically every scripture that I read. I reword it. And then I rephrase it. And there are times when I take out you shall to I shall and I personalize it. You need to do that. Work the word of God. Come on, go back to it. What's not working out? Let me work the word. Personalize it. Rephrase it. Paraphrase it. Make it applicable to me. Put the word in front of me so I can see it constantly. Are you good with that? Yes. And if all else fails, get more scriptures. Mm, yes. So now watch this now. And this is a powerful illustration and I'll share it and qualify it in just a moment. So I say to you, car, what comes to mind? It's not C-A-R. When I say car, words don't come to mind. 
pictures come to mind. So I say call, and right from Sharon to Caroline on that side, pictures are emerging and entering your mind. Some are seeing a big car, some are seeing a small car, some are seeing an SUV, some are seeing a two-door, some are seeing a lorry, whatever. Because I say car, your mind runs to town. But now, I say to you, it's a Toyota, and I give you the make, the model, and the color. Suddenly, the picture in your mind changes. You are no longer running with random thoughts where car is concerned. I've given you a more accurate picture. Your mind is focused on the Toyota, the make, the model, the color. You've got a more accurate picture in your mind. And it's the same with the Word of God. You've got to go back and get more scriptures so that the thing you're believing and praying for becomes more clear, becomes more apparent, becomes more plausible and reachable and doable in your life. Hallelujah. Watch this. Jesus spoke about unbelief. In Matthew 17, verse 20, Jesus said, Because of your unbelief, verily I say unto you, if you have faith the grain as size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Remove yonder, and it shall be removed. And listen to what he says down here. And nothing shall be impossible to you. It's not the size of your faith, it's the doubt that's hindering the faith you already have. And Jesus is saying you need to deal with your doubt. If we can remove the doubt, the faith you already have is good enough, big enough, strong enough for any miracle. If you could get saved by the faith that you have, your faith is good enough, big enough, strong enough for healing, for deliverance, for financial breakthrough, for just about anything. There's no faith on faith unless you're talking about the gift of faith. And how are you going to get the gift of faith if you're not operating in this faith? Mm -hmm. Now watch this. Jesus said nothing. These words are important, church. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. He's not talking about pastors, leaders, apostles, and, and evangelists. He's talking about the everyday person that makes up the church. Can you see that? Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Now this is very key because in Genesis 11 verse 6, the people are beginning to build a tower known as the Tower of Babel. It's a very interesting portion of scripture. I'd like you to follow it up. And there's so many talking points because of time. I'm not going to get into it. I was planning to. I'm not going to get into it. But God says, let's go down and see what these people are doing. So God goes down and this is what God says. He says, the people of the earth are speaking the same language. The other translations say, the people of the earth are united. He says, let us stop them and listen to what his word says. Because nothing they set out to do will be impossible for them. In other words, they were going to accomplish this tower up to heaven. They were going to do it. So God says, let's stop them. So if God can help you this morning, eliminate that little doubt that's getting in your way. Your faith is going to work for you. Amen. In Jesus' name, glory to God. Hallelujah. The only thing holding you back is you. It's not circumstance. It's not the economy. It's not COVID-19. The only thing holding you back is you. In Jesus' name. Come on now this morning. Get a hold of this. The only thing holding back is you. Listen closely. When the devil persists with lies, you must insist with the truth. When the devil persists with lies, you must insist with the truth. In other words, many times we pray for things, we don't see the manifestation. And the devil will come by Monday and say, don't think that's working out. I don't think you're going to get that. I think that was a, a ridiculous prayer. I think that was a ridiculous sermon even to preach to those people. You've got to double up with the truth and say, listen devil, it is written. Because when the devil came to Jesus, the only conversation he had with him was the word of God. And he said, it is written. It is written. Every time the devil insists with his lies, it is written. Double up with the truth of God's word. You need to have what is called good God faith. When you bite down on a truth of God's word. And don't be like the person that said to me, yeah, we've been trying this for years, we're not seeing this. You must have good dog faith. What is good dog faith? Now, I don't mean to get canine on you. But a bulldog's face is built in such a way can you see the picture? Yeah. Yeah. It's really so see the picture? See that flat nose? Mm. Do you know why he's built, created that way? When a bulldog bites, 
it bites down and doesn't fight. But its nose is built in such a way it can breathe in and out and hold. Other canines with a long snout cannot do that. They'll bite and they'll hold on, but they can't breathe. They've got to let go in order to breathe. If you know your canines, you'll know what I'm talking about. Other dogs have got to let go. They can hold on long, but when they're running out of breath, they've got to let go, breathe quickly and bite again. A bulldog doesn't. That's why he normally wins the fight with other dogs. He can bite and continue to breathe. We need to learn, child of God, how to bite down on something and breathe at the same time and say, I'm not letting go until the situation surrenders to me. Hallelujah. And when I let go, I'm waking up the victor and not the victim in the situation. I'm going to hold on, hold on faith. I've got a scripture. I'm holding down and biting on the scripture. You've got to know on the inside you are so convinced that the lies you hear on the outside don't affect you anymore. You say, I know, I know. You walk around, I know. His word says, I believe his word. His word says, I know, I know. He spoke his word to me. And his word is as real today as it was back in the day. I know. Hallelujah. You know when you've got it down on the inside. You believe more in what you know than in what you are hearing from the outside. This is when conception has taken place. The entrance of your word, as Pastor Rogers prayed this morning, the entrance of the word brings light, brings life, and brings hope. Now listen closely. You must have a word of revelation before material restoration can take place. You must have a word of revelation before material restoration can take place. Revelation is anything you can see in the spirit realm. Say that again. Revelation is anything you can see in the spirit realm. If you can see it, then you won't doubt it. Once the picture becomes a reality, you have a revelation. Revelation leads to restoration. Glory to God. Now watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. Let's challenge your faith and take it out to another level. Take it out a little further. Amen. Let's launch out a little deeper. Watch this. You've got to see yourself exactly in the same position as Adam before the fall. The word forgive means to go back to a time before the offense. This is why we teach married couples forgiveness. Because very often they forgive but they say, I won't forget. <laughs> Takers. Just keep looking straight ahead. To forgive someone means to go back before the offense and treat them like you used to treat them before the offense. That's true forgiveness. Now if God expects us to do it, He must do it. So if He's going to forgive me for my financial indiscretion, He's going to take me back to a time before the offense. In fact, He's going to take me back to the time before Adam fell. You've got to see yourself in the same situation Adam was in. Adam was in a blessed situation. Hallelujah. God, just, God didn't forgive us just to leave us where we are. His plan is to take us out. Remember last week we spoke about being translated. You're forgiven and translated. Now come back into that Eden way of living. Amen. And we spoke on Eden last week. Praise God. And you must continually praise God for your dead freedom. Praise keeps the door of abundance wide open. Lift your hands and say this with me this morning. Our God is able. Our God is able. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now keep this written agreement before you that I mentioned, uh, that I just started outlining. Keep this written agreement before you and refer to it often. What I like to do when I pray over my dead situation is that I take a day in the week, like a Tuesday, for instance. Tuesday is court day. You cannot pray about court prayers and don't go to court. In the natural, if you've got a, a legal situation and you hire an attorney, they'll say to you, Tuesday, 10 o'clock, you must be in court. You don't say, no, let the attorney go. The judge will say, where's your client? You're going to rock up in prayer in the presence of your attorney, advocate Jesus, and you pray these prayers. Amen. And I'll get back into this. In order for faith to work, listen to this. 
In order for faith to work, it must be given an assignment. In order for faith to work effectively, it must be given an assignment. It must be given a target. An assignment and a target. I, I, I did this message in the course of the week, but I couldn't rewrite this message that I sent out. The God who sees, remember it, the God who sees. But this little woman with the issue of blood kept saying in her heart, if I can just come up behind him. Notice what it said in the Amplified Version, if you read it. The Amplified says she kept saying it. She didn't say it once. She kept saying it, if I can just come up behind him. She kept saying it until it became a reality. She kept saying it until she actually began to do it. She actually began to action out her prayers. What she was internalizing, she actioned out. She began to walk it out and she came up behind him. Hallelujah. And she touched the hem of his garment. Now earlier on I said to you, if I say car, what comes to mind? You had all pictures, shapes and sizes. But if I say Toyota, give you the make, the model, the year, it changes the picture. Now I'm going to take this a level further. I'm going to say to you, now this car is yours. It's yours. Now the picture changes. You're not looking at it from a distance. Now you're seeing yourself coming up to it, opening the door. Come on now with me this morning. Let's take a journey, a virtual journey. You're getting behind the wheel, not the passenger side. You're getting behind the wheel. I've got those keys, all those beautiful remote buttons. They wow. One's going to open the tent. One's going to open the boot. Wow. You know, I'm getting in there. I can see myself turning it out of the gate here. I can see myself turning it into my driveway. This is how you work the word of God. She said, if I can come up behind him. She made the way clear in her mind with the word of God. I can see myself in the promises of God. And as I'm getting well, I'm stepping out of this bed. The bed of confinement. The bed of affliction. I'm walking away from this thing. I no longer need a bed outside of the temple to lie on and beg. I'm going to wrap it up and I'm going to put it away. I don't need it. I can see myself coming out of my financial situation. I can see myself paying off my creditors. Hallelujah. And she kept saying it and she kept saying it and she walked out the reality of what she was internalizing. That's what you've got to do. Come on now. Glory to God. And as you do this, the word becomes a stronghold in your mind. What is a stronghold? Something your mind goes back to time and time and time again. You can't change it. That's a stronghold. When the word becomes a stronghold, sickness comes and you says no. You say no, that's not for me. I'm healed in Jesus' name. Sickness comes and you say no, I'm walking in divine health. Hallelujah. Financial challenges come and you say no, I've got the blessing of God. I've got the empowerment of God upon me. I don't need this. I don't accept this. The word becomes a stronghold and that becomes your point of reference. Faith is an arrow that must be released from the bow of hope. And like this widow woman caught up with Jesus, faith must catch up with him. Or else it's not really faith, it's just, it's just church talk. Faith must put you on this path and faith must catch up with Jesus. Watch this. You must be in alignment with him and follow him in the way. And then the culmination of this whole thing, faith must eventually touch him. Because when you touch him, faith gets his attention. That's when he swirls around in the crowd and he says, who touched me? Because power went out of me. The prayers that you pray in faith must bring you alignment, into alignment, bring you behind him in proximity to him and eventually touch. Amen. Hallelujah. That's how we get the Holy Ghost when we are anointed and filled with the Holy Ghost. We've been touched by him Amen. because we came close enough to be touched. And he says, some power has gone out of me. Yes. Can God say this morning, power has gone out of him. Someone, yes. someone is drawing so powerfully yes. on him this morning. He feels that power and he wants to release more of it into you, into your life, into your situation. The faith is enough to get his attention that he says, what do you want me to do for you? Mm. Oh, what a wonderful statement. What do you want me to do for you? Your faith has got my attention. Jesus, this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Are you still with me this morning? Are you still here? Yeah. Hallelujah. You've got to understand that behind there is a spirit. You're dealing with devils. You're doing warfare with what we're talking about. 
we're not just talking money. Get a little bit of money in your pocket, come buy yourself a dress, buy yourself a suit, buy yourself a pants. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking spiritual stuff here. You're doing warfare. You're doing warfare with the enemy. You're giving. You don't just lightly give it into those trays and offering baskets. You are doing an act of warfare every time you release it. In Jesus' name, this breaks the power of the enemy. This breaks the back of, of poverty over my life. Come on. Hallelujah in the name of Jesus. It's not the money, not the son. It's the act that is released in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Point number one, make a decision. Point number two, write it out, map it out clearly before God. And point number three, watch this. Stay in a continual state of sowing and reaping. God says in His Word, Luke 6, 38, He says, Give and it shall be given back to you. He is the God who reciprocates. Yes. Jerry Savelle once said, and this is a man, a minister, who is walking in debt freedom and financial excellence. And so he's allowed to talk to us this morning. And so I quote him. And so Jerry Savelle says, When you talk to the Lord about your need, He'll talk to you about your seed. Do you like that? A God is a seed-minded God. We don't just pray our way out of there. You give your way out of there. Hallelujah. I need more people on board now. I hope I haven't lost you along the way. Point one, point two. You don't just pray your way out. You've got to give your way out of there. Hallelujah. Stay with me. God is a seed-minded God. Genesis 8.22 while the earth remains, uh, another translation says, while the earth exists, question, is the world still existing? Then that means this is applicable to us. Thank you very much. While the earth is, exists, remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. This little widow woman in 2 Kings chapter 4, I believe it is, the woman who had the creditors coming to take her sons away, you know the story, they are shared lost me. She came and she said, they're coming to take my sons away. She cried out to God. Now, if you're not tracking with me, someone would say, that, that, that prophet was really irresponsible. Shame on him. Comes to a poor widow woman. She's in need and he takes from her. Because the man says, what do you have in your house? Come on, if you get on board with this, your miracle is beginning to work for you. What do you have in your house? God will never ask you for something you don't have. Before Elijah could multiply the flour and the wheat in the widow woman of Zarephath, he said, first, make me little cake. Mm -hmm. She said, no, I've got so much. It seems illogical to do that. But debt freedom is dependent upon you staying in a continual state of sowing and reaping. When we honor the Lord with our tithing and giving, we become candidates for overflow, and that's according to Proverbs chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. I could preach at length on these things. This really floats my boat. We could talk at length. We could have lunch come back. But let me just shorten things. Amen. Please forgive me. Let me tell you a true story. Because stories coupled with teachings and testimonies is powerful. There was a man that used to walk with us in this church, a very good time faithful tither. Um, eventually, he worked for one of these government concerns and uh, due to the politics in the company and the changing of staff and management, you know where I'm going to with this without being specific, um, they made him an offer and they demoted him. So he either accepted that or he had to take the package. So he accepted the package and he came out and he said he believes God's leading him and God's going to lead him into greener pastures. So he accepted the um, payout. And every month he is to pay his tithes from his payout. Now he had the lump sum. And he worked it out. He was an astute businessman. It worked out for about six months that he could live off this money. He needed his breakthrough within the six months. So he had six months' tithes worked out. So every month he'd bring his tithes, we'd pray over it. It came to his last time. Still no breakthrough. And as I said, we, we prayed with him. And I was about to pray with him. And I said to him, please, please, keep your time. Mm. 
I really don't think we need it and God doesn't need it. I think God understands your situation. I don't know what exactly I said to him. I, I'm not going to lie. But the point is I didn't want his tie because I used to pray with him. Every I didn't want it. It's his last tie. And he hasn't got a job. Doors haven't opened. Windows haven't sprung open as they say. If a door don't open, a window will be good enough as long as it's from heaven. Yeah. But nothing happened. I said, don't. He said, Pastor, I'm a giver. I believe in giving. I will never back down on my commitment. And much to my chagrin and reluctantly I accepted it, but we prayed with him. Within the next month, he got his breakthrough. We're not just talking breakthrough, we're talking breakthrough. Can I be a little more transparent? When I'm talking breakthrough, if someone brings a church a million rand, Do the maths. What's the breakthrough? He trusted God right down to the last time. If he had obeyed me, I shudder to think of the consequences. We could have delayed his breakthrough. Tie the million rand to his breakthrough. You do the maths and figure out what his breakthrough was. He came down to his last time. So let me help you here now. As I said, I don't have the overheads. I'm going to try and I'm going to work with you here. So you are getting out of debt. Keep in this continual state of sowing and reaping. And this is where it gets interesting. Let me throw this out there. Let's say you believe in God for a million rand. You believe in God for a million. You either want to get out of debt or you want to buy something. A million rand. How old are you with me? So now as we've been taught in church circles, put a seed down. What do you have in your house? So what's the tithe on a million? It's like a hundred thousand. So you might say to myself, but uh, okay, wait a minute now. I, I believe in praying, but I believe in putting a seed down. A, a, so a seed. A seed for you. I don't have a hundred thousand. I'm believing for a million. Let's stay with that target in mind. But I don't have a hundred thousand. Then you go back to the scriptures and you say, I believe that God provides seed for the sower. Because that's in the word of God. I believe that God provides seed for the sower. I want to sow seeds. I want to bring my breakthrough seed. Lord, I'm believing you for a hundred thousand. Because now you're chasing a target of a million. But now, you look around and the hundred thousand is not around. Looking high and low, believing and trusting. Are you looking for me? Do you want to say something? Okay. Mm. You forgot? Did you forget to phone me? And you should have phoned me. Okay. Yeah. You check it. Faith without hints is dead. So you're doing everything in the natural. Take care of the natural God and take care of the supernatural. Okay. So the hundred thousand is nowhere in sight. So what you do? You drop the million. Now you're not. You are not uh, renegotiating. You're not dropping your standards. But you're now going to make a target of half a million. As your target. So now, okay, well, let's believe for half a million. So what's the tithe of the 10% of the seed weight on that? 50,000. So okay, Lord, where's the 50,000? Do the same thing. Talk to all your friends and business partners. See who owes you money. See who wants to give you. See if there's a, a policy that's suddenly matured and you need to call them about it. You do these things. Maybe there's a policy that's matured. You need to go and check up tomorrow. Something like that. Okay, now you look and you say, no, 50,000 is no way in sight. Now let's bring it down to one step lower. Instead of believing for the million, instead of believing for the half a million, make it 250,000. Now on 250,000, you need a down payment or a seed rate of 25,000. So now that's in the realm of possibility. Right? That's doable. We could make something happen here. We could see the policy. We could get that money. Now if you are determined to reach the one million mark, you will do something like this. Be very careful. Something like this. You'll make it happen. Find that 25,000 and you, by faith, with God's leading, put it down and trust God for the remainder of the money. So from that 250, you're now building up till you get to half a mil. From that half a mil, you can work towards one mil. But whatever your situation, don't wait on God to get you out of your financial despair. Give your way out, believe God, trust God for a plan to get you out. Now you might say, listen, 25,000 is too much. You don't realize what I earn. Then bring it right down to 5,000. 
My first target is 5,000. Off that is 500 rands. So let's believe God for that. And then you use this model and you begin to build up by faith with God's leading until you get your target of 1 million. You seeing this? Instead of sitting back and saying, I'm waiting, I've prayed, I've fasted. All that's happening is you're getting thin with all the fasting. <laughs> and your bank account looks the same. It's as thin as you. You do nothing. What do you have in your house? Now, I just used a model. But remember, it doesn't have to be. Now, I got 5,000. If you believe in for 5,000, that's 500. If you believe in for 250,000, it's 25,000. It doesn't have to be that size. What does God say to you? What is in your house? In other words, if you're believing for one million, God could say to you, put 1,000 up. I don't know. This is not a formula. So don't go out and try it as a formula. What does God lay on your heart? I just put a logical, plausible, reasonable example out there. And it's if you, are, if you want to buy yourself another house, this is how you do it. And what I felt very strongly about is that I need to share this with the young people in the house. Because the young people need to learn this. Forgive me if I'm just going on with a bit of time. We'll get back to winning ways next week. Amen. It's a different <laughs> week. We teach them to get jobs. They get nice jobs. They live with mom and dad. They don't pay rent. They don't pay water. They don't pay lights. So the bank account's looking good. It's shop. Nice. They can, they can pay for their car, pay for their clothing, and still have money left over. The problem comes in when they get married. Now we can't afford a house. So what do they do? Follow mom and dad's example. Mom and dad takes them down to the bank. This is the same bank, son. Same bank. This is the bank gave me the loan for the house we're living in. Then they give a loan for the house you and your wife are going to be. And so you teach them to get in there. Now listen, listen here, young people. You don't have to follow that route. You can start using this model and say, listen, I want a car. I want a decent car, a half a million rands car, a 250,000 rands car, and start using this model to sow towards it to, so, the, so that you get the money to pay it off cash. And using this model, you can go all the way up and buy yourself a house. Think about it when you get married, how much further you will be in your finances if you didn't have house, mortgage payments, and car payments. Think about it, cash in your house, cash you got your car, and you start your marriage. Most marriages suffer because of finances. So young people learn this. You can sow your way towards it. Now listen, I gave you a model. I said if you need a million, how about a hundred thousand? And you can go back to God and pray and say, Lord, you provide seed for the sower. Provide me with the seed because I want to bring a seed faith towards you. And listen, the Bible says in Daniel 6 verse 3, it says, And Daniel was preferred about the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. Now what you can do is begin to pray and say, There is an excellent spirit in me. Hallelujah. And I am different to all the other people in the land. I have an excellent spirit. And the Bible says that God chose Bezalel. How many of you heard of Bezalel? I'm so glad you're here this morning. Let me tell you about Bezalel. So Moses brings the Israelites out of Egypt and God shows him the blueprint for building the temple. The temple, the, the temple in the wilderness. Not the one that Solomon built. So Moses looks at it and says, that's wonderful to have a vision of heaven. And then he asks God this way, who's going to build it? Because I can see it, but I can't build that. So God says to him, not to worry, I've got a man by the name of Bezalel in whom I have placed the spirit of wisdom and cunning craftiness, who understands how to work with raw iron. He'll build this thing according to the plan. You, you now go to God and you say, Lord, you've given me an impossible task, a hundred thousand to put towards a million. But God will put within you the spirit of Bezalel, the spirit of wisdom and cunning craftiness, a more excellent spirit that God will enable you to do work in order to get that money, in order to put your seat paid down, in order to get your target in Jesus' name. So God doesn't just leave you to it. This is a time to involve Him. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. And then God gives you the wisdom of the Proverbs 31 woman. She is clothed with dignity and strength. She can laugh at the days to come. In other words, adversity. She speaks with wisdom and, and faithful instruction as on a tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not cast her bread of idleness. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. The widow woman came with a cruise of oil. What do you have in your house? A cruise of oil. In 
relation to the magnitude of the breakthrough, the Prophet said, sell it and live off it all the days of your life. Is that in the word? Yeah. But what did she give? A cruise of oil. I don't know what God's going to ask you to give. But that big breakthrough, do you believe in? Jesus took five loaves and two fish and he fed 5,000 men notwithstanding women and children. I don't know what your fives and your twos are that's going to lead to the miracle take care of the thousands and the thousands of that matter. Amen. Glory to God. Let each man give as he has purpose in his heart. Be sure you have a seed in the ground before you can expect God to do anything for you. And then when you've placed your seed in the ground, you must name your seed. Name that seed and say, this is my breakthrough seed. This is my getting out of debt seed. Name that seed. Have you put a seed in the ground this morning even as we speak? I know I've put seeds in the ground. I've put plenty of seeds in the ground. And they've got names. Okay, that sounds a little ludicrous, but some people have got gardens at home and they name their plants. Mm -hmm. And the cats name the dogs. So you've named your plant. I decided to name my seed so I can call it. So when I call it, it comes to me, not you. Amen. Amen. Because I gave her the name. Come, break through seed. You come to me. Blessed seed. You come to me. Amen. Point number four, get into a covenant agreement with God. Hebrews 8 verse 6 says, Now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, by which also he is mediator of a better covenant, which is established upon better promises. When you go to the world system for a loan, you are entering into a covenant with them. It is like a covenant because they give you the conditions and you choose to live by them. So going to the world for a loan is an alternate covenant. And we need to realize that we have a covenant with God. We are in covenant with God. But I've got to be real and I've got to be honest with you and repent of a lot of things. I knew all of this. But I was raised in churches where people led us with false information. And I'm here to debunk all of that and to set the record straight for God's people. Is that all right with you? We've heard about this prosperity things for hundreds of years. But like the other people that spoke to me, we also were misled. We have these people in church come and tell us, yes, God has blessed us. God has given me a call. I can think of one person. This person was blessed with an oval monza, white one, with a, with a soft top. Some of you from the old El Shaddai day will already figure out where I'm going. You might remember this. And then the person said, I've been given a house very close to where Brother Morgan is living. Back then, all the elite Portuguese and Italians were living on that, on that set. I saw the house. Because this person, I used to pick this person up for action teams. God has given me a house, given me a car. Wow. I said to my wife, God gives houses and God gives cars. Wow, I mean it too. I'm naming it, claiming it. My name is Jake. I'll have all I can take. My name is Brian, this is mine. I'm believing. <laughs> I'm believing. Until the person, one day we had a conversation, the person said, what? I'm going to pay for this. I'm going to pay the bank for that car. I'm going to pay the bank for that uh, house. <laughs> oh, lights have gone on. I thought you said God gave it. Mm. It's either God gave it or you bought it. Mm. Either way, let's praise God for it. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But you're going to decide, did God give it or did, or did you buy it? But I'm here to tell you that God does give things. He said to the Israelites, I'll bring you into the promised land. I'll give you houses you did not build. I'll give you wells you did not dig. I'll give you vines you did not plant. Give that firmly into your faith, entrenched into your heart, and believe God for the impossible. Because I had to repent of that and say, I'm back to winning ways. I believe God can do the impossible. God gives things. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Amen. All the gold and the silver belongs to Him. It doesn't belong to the drug lords, the pimps and the prostitutes. It belongs to God. And God wants to give it to His people. Have you looked at jewelry? I saw of jewels the other day, sparkling jewels, gold and diamonds and emeralds and things. It's beautiful, man. I, 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 regardless of how much it's worth, I just want to have it. Yeah. yeah. Who made it? God did. Who did he make it for? Yeah. And when he built his temple, what did he use to build his temple? All the precious stones. In the book of Genesis, he gave Adam authority over every stone and every gem that's in the earth. 
If you buy a house today, it's made from brick, slime, and mortar that comes from where? Everything in that house comes from here. It doesn't come from outer space. God gave you authority over it. Walk all over this earth and say, God has given me authority to tread, trample upon this earth. Everything that's under my feet is subject to me. I have the money to pay for this house, the car that comes from the ground too. I have the money to pay for this house that comes from the ground too. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Realize that God's got a covenant with you. And when, Abraham, when Jacob was leaving for his journey to Uncle Laban, God said, I will not leave you until I have done everything I promised to do. God has got a wonderful covenant. How many of you know that? We need to get back to being in covenant with God. Or remember that we are in covenant with God. Examine the premises and the promises and lay hold of them. Amen. In the name of Jesus, glory to God. Death takes, it never gives. Remember the widow woman? She said, they've come to take my sons. Death takes, it never gives. They'll offer you something on loan. In this covenant with God, God gives. He doesn't loan you things. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. When you have a covenant, no devil can deny what you have access to and what is granted to you in the covenant. Once you come into this covenant understanding, you have a right to every promise that God has made to Abraham. If we suffer, you need to enter God's rest. Enter God's rest. The year 2022 is a Shemitah year of rest and release. 2022. A Shemitah year of rest and release. Is that right? Watch this now. We need to enter God's rest. In Genesis 12 and 3, God says to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you abundantly. And I will make your name great, exalted and distinguished. And I will make you a blessing and a source of blessing to others. Notice what God said. He said, I will make you. You will not make yourself. When we are in covenant and you understand the covenantal obligations of the Father, you can enter into rest and cease from your labors and efforts to get the things that are causing you to sweat. God said, gather manna for six days, and on the seventh day you rest. God was trying to show them that I want to take care of you in your time of rest. There's enough provision. Yes. And if we understand covenant, we can understand God's rest and we can get into God's rest. 2022 is a year of rest and release. Hallelujah. Your debt cancellation plan should not cause pressure on you because it is wrapped up in faith. When the pressure starts, press towards peace. Resist the temptation to become impatient. Stay with it until you are out of debt. You don't need to figure out a plan, a plan. God will tell you what to do. An indication of, of, of faith is your ability to rest. An indication of faith is your ability to rest. Jesus is in the back part of the boat. The disciples are riding and braving the storm. The winds and the storms are contrary. The disciples are fighting, bailing out water from the boat that seems to be going, seems to be going down. Fighting the winds, and Jesus is asleep. Can you see that picture in your mind? Jesus is at rest because Jesus knows the Father has given him a mission to go over to the other side, to go and release the man of Gidara from 2,000 demons, clothe him, leave him in his right mind, get back into the boat, come back over and continue with his assignment on this side. So Jesus knows I'm not going to die. I'll die one day, but not today. Jesus realizes that I am in the will of God. And the safest place to be is in the will of God, regardless of the storms that are blowing all around me. The best place to be is in the will of God. I'm safe and I'm provided for. So Jesus is asleep. He's in a place of rest. The disciples are fighting. An indication of your faith is the ability to rest in God and not be troubled by what's happening around you. 
Are we getting this? Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. The good shepherd wants to bring us to a place of rest so that we can hear his voice. You can't get out of debt if you can't hear his voice. And you will not hear his voice unless you come to a place of rest. Because when you are too concerned and too troubled, you can't hear him. How many of you know that? So in this time of rest, you can hear God. In this time of rest, you trust God's perfect timing. He makes everything beautiful in his time. Amen. And worry is simply a down payment on something that might never happen. Hallelujah. So in closing, I want to say, roll all care over unto him. Roll all care over unto him. Believe him and trust him. He's got a plan. He's got a strategy. Your job is to lock into what is that plan, what is that strategy, and how you can cooperate with God towards getting out. Amen. In Jesus' name. I've got much more to share with you and to say, but let's just leave it down there and we'll get back to winning ways perhaps next week. Amen. As the Lord leads us. In Jesus' name. We want to break bread. It's extremely important that we break bread together. And um, we're going to ask the pastors, elders, and deacons over here to bring, around, bring about the communion elements. And we're going to use it in one final point. To bring this whole man's teachings to an end. Let's take communion together. Hallelujah. Now you hold in your hands the bread that represents the body of our Lord Jesus Christ. You hold in your hand the cup that represents the blood that was shed, that was spilt for you. But very quickly, I just want to share this. And I hope this powerful revelation helps you like it did me. You know, I was raised in a very traditional church, in traditional circles. Um, as some of you know, and my family knows, we were raised Roman Catholic. And so we used to have communion. And when it came to this, the cup and the bread, they called it communion. And when you're this old, you don't know what communion means. You think it's just a fancy word for bread and the cup. So all through my life I've called this communion. Until I was hit with a revelation. Communion means fellowship. Communion means to interact. Communion means to become one with something or someone. And so Jesus said, when you take this, you take my body. When you take this cup, you're taking my blood. So communion means to become one with Christ. 
Now watch this. When Jesus healed the leper, the lepers came to him. He didn't heal them from afar and say, you know, you can't come near me, lepers is bad. Get healed. He healed and fall. No, he came. And what did he do? He touched them. He placed his hands. But he did not get leprosy. But the leper got healed. When you become one with him through the communion elements, you're bringing sickness in your body. And the great exchange takes place. By becoming one with you, you take what is on me, and I take what's on you. You bring him debt to him, he takes it, and he gives you what he's got. As he is in heaven, so are we here on earth. He conquered hell, sin, death, and the grave, and your financial situation. This is the great exchange. Communion, I'm becoming one with him. He's not becoming poor because I'm poor. He's not becoming in debt because I'm in debt. He's taking what I've got and I'm taking what he's got. He's financially free. He's operating according to the big powerful dollar of heaven. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. I'm getting that currency instead of this weak currency, whatever it might be. In the name of Jesus. This is the great exchange. Now take the bread. And whatever you believe in God for, be it health, be it your financial situation, be it debt freedom. You are taking what He is giving to you by becoming one with Him. Go ahead, receive it this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Hold up the cup. The Israelites were in bondage to Egypt for 450 years. On the night of their release, God asked them to slaughter the lamb. Then they would take they were to take the blood and apply it to the doorposts and the lintels of their homes. And that very same night, God said, you will gird your loins and put on your sandals because this is the beginning of the great exodus. You are now leaving. You are now leaving. You are now leaving. This is the great exodus as we culminate this whole month's series teaching into one. You're going into a new month. This is the great exodus. You're coming out. You're coming out. You're coming out in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. And you're not coming out empty-handed. You're coming out with 450 years worth of salary and pay. And as God leads you out of Egypt, which is the world system of bondage, God says, yes, something for your daddy as well. What your dad didn't get, you're going to get. Take his share and leave this place. You are leaving that place of bondage. You are leaving that place of lack. In Jesus' name. The better speakings of the blood this morning, my friend. I speak the better speakings of the blood over your situation, over your financial situation, over your health, over your situation, over your marriage, over your life in Jesus' name. The better speakings of the blood this morning. Hallelujah. Go ahead and take the cup. In Jesus' mighty name. Glory. Glory. Glory to God. And uh, you may be seeing what we are talking about, the testimony that's so powerful. Let's take a look us. See you next week, same time, same place. God bless you. Amen.